People who pray to Mary, who offer up Hail Mary, thinking that she's going to answer some prayer for them. Mary knew nothing of the sort. She didn't answer this herself. She ran to Jesus to answer that question for her. Jesus, though, was keenly aware of his mission. And he knew what would take place should he openly display his glory in this moment. Should he openly show his, his ability to change the molecular components of water and turn it into something completely different? That's why Jesus says, woman, what has this concern to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus knew if he were to do this, if he were to create wine out of nothing, if he was to demonstrate his miraculous power as God in the flesh at this moment in time he knew that the people at the wedding would take him by force to Jerusalem and make him be their earthly king which Jesus did not come to be Jesus knew that to, to display his glory at this moment in that way would cause them to bring him to Jerusalem and have a coronation ceremony. But Jesus knew that his coronation was not going to be on some throne in Jerusalem that was at that moment in time occupied by Herod. Uh, by Herod. He knew that, that his coronation ceremony wasn't a golden crown being put on his head and a scepter being placed in his hand. No, he knew that his coronation ceremony was on a hill called Mount Calvary when they would take a crown of thorns and press it into his brow. He could not at this moment reveal himself to the world as God in the flesh. It was not time. No, even here at the wedding, at the very first miracle of Jesus, he had his eyes set on the cross of Calvary. May we live our lives ever focused on the cross of Jesus. Miss Barbara, may we live our lives with our eyes fixed on the sacrifice that was made on our behalf by him. May we ever proceed to be an example to a lost and dying world of what it means to take up the cross of Christ and carry it on a daily basis. May we come to the foot of the cross this morning and echo the words of Jesus and say, not my will, but thy will, O Lord, be done in me. May we forever praise him for what he did on that dreadful yet glorious day some 2,000 years ago when he was pierced for our transgressions and when he was crushed for our iniquities. Oh, that our hearts would forever be set and our eyes would forever gaze upon the crucified Lord who gave it all so that we may have life. Jesus knew it was not his time. His eyes were on Calvary. What a difference it would make in our lives if we lived our lives with a constant reminder that without Christ and without the cross and without the resurrection, we would be lost with no hope of ever having a relationship of being, and being reconciled to God in heaven. Jesus had his eyes always on the cross of Calvary. The third and final thing that I want you to see this morning is this. When you come to Jesus, he gets rid of the old and he gives you something brand new. Jesus lived his life amongst the people. Jesus lived his life always with his eyes focused on Calvary. When you come to Jesus, he'll take away the old and he'll give you something brand new. Now, Let's ask the question, did Jesus turn this wine into fermented wine? Let's read together the next few verses of Scripture. Verse 5, Mary said, do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did 
When the chief servant tasted the water, after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the groom and told him, told the, him, everyone who sets out to find wine first, then after people have drunk freely, the inferior, but you have kept the fine wine, the good wine, until now. Now, what did Jesus turn this water into? We must note, as I said earlier, the Greek word used for wine here in the text is the word winos. It's used of the wine both before the miracle and the wine that Jesus created with the water. But what does this word winos mean and can we draw any conclusions from it? Winos can actually mean both fermented and unfermented wine. Now that means this, that there is a possibility, at least a possibility, that before the wine ran out, that the wine was fermented. There's equally a possibility that the wine that Jesus created was fermented. We cannot take away the meaning of the word, but there's also the possibility with it meaning both fermented and unfermented wine, that there's the possibility that both were unfermented before and after the miracle. And then there's the chance that one could have been fermented and one wasn't. With the original Greek usage of the word, we cannot be sure enough to really draw any conclusions just from this text as to whether or not Jesus created fermented wine. But as with any scripture, we can look at the entire counsel of God and we can make a determination as to whether the wine that Jesus created was fermented or not. Now let's remember first of all this, 2 Timothy 3.16, what? All scripture is inspired by who? By God. We remember that John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John tells us that Jesus is the Word of God. We know in John 1, verse number 14, the Word became flesh. We as Christians believe what? That Jesus is God. We believe that he's the second person of the Trinity. We believe that he's God in the flesh. And we believe that Jesus, as God, wrote this Bible. So saying those things, we have to know this, that Jesus would never go against his word. He would never do something to go against it. Because if he did, it would be sinful. So saying those things, we must examine the whole counsel of God. And we must see what the Bible says about wine fermented wine specifically, and by examining those things, we should be able to make a conclusion, did Jesus turn it into fermented wine? Now, there are two Hebrew words in the Old Testament that talk about wine. The first Old Testament word is this, the word yayin. Now, that word in the Old Testament of that wine, it can be translated, later fermented or unfermented wine. But the majority of time that you find the word yayin used in the Old Testament, it speaks of new wine. Now, what is new wine, you ask? New wine is freshly pressed juice from the grape. Juice that has not had the opportunity to go through the fermentation process. It's freshly squeezed, and it's brand new right from the vine. It's this wine that God wrote in his word in Psalm 104, 14, that the Lord causes the grass to grow for the livestock and provides crops for man to cultivate, producing food from the earth, wine, yayin, that makes the heart glad, making his face shine with oil and bread that sustains the heart. Ecclesiastes 9, 17, the writer there said, go eat your bread with pleasure, and drink your wine, your yayin, your new wine, with a cheerful heart. For God has already accepted your works. Of this type of wine, the Bible says it's okay to drink. This would be our modern day grape juice. Freshly pressed from the vine, from the grape. Of this, the Bible says we, as believers, can partake. But then there's a second word 
to describe the wine in the Old Testament, and that is the word shekhar, which means strong drink, alcoholic drink, fermented drink. Of this type of wine, the Bible says that we as believers should not under any circumstances drink it. It's of this wine that the writer of Proverbs wrote, wine, shekhar, is a mocker. Beer is a brawler, and whoever staggers because of them is not wise. It's of this type of wine that Isaiah wrote, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, shekhar, that continue into night until the wine, the shekhar, inflames them. It's of this wine that Isaiah wrote in 522, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink, Shekhar, wine, and men of strength to mingle with them. The Bible throughout condemns the sin of drunkenness, even the New Testament, where we're free to live in Christ, liberty in Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit. So if the Bible condemns the sin of drunkenness, follow me, if the Bible condemns the sin of drunkenness and the Bible is written by God and Jesus is God, then it is ludicrous for anybody to think that Jesus would create something that would lead men in to sin. Remember the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Would Jesus tempt a man with fermented wine? His brother James didn't think so. James wrote, no one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Would Jesus create fermented wine and tempt men at the wedding with drunkenness? No. <laughs> By looking at the whole counsel of scripture, although it's possible that the wine before the miracle was fermented, I do not see any evidence scripturally to point to the fact that Jesus created fermented wine. He couldn't. It would be against his word. It would be against himself. Now you say, well, my friends say that Jesus created fermented wine. Stop taking your advice from ungodly friends. Look at what the Bible says. Now saying all of those things, if Jesus did not turn it into fermented wine, what did he turn it into? Well, I believe if we look at the text together, we'll figure it out. Do whatever he tells you, Mary said. Now, six stone water jars had been set there. Y'all listen. Now, this is about to get good. Six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said, now draw some out. And take it to the chief servant. And they did. When the chief servant tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it had came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the groom. And he says, everyone sets out the good wine first. Then after people have drunk freely, the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. I believe that looking at this text, Jesus turned the water into something that had not been tasted since the Garden of Eden. I believe that Jesus, as the creator of the universe, turned this water into good wine. Now think all the way back to Genesis chapter number 1. Jesus created the heavens and the earth. He created the light. He created the land. He created the water. He created the birds. He created the fish. He created man. And what does he always say? He saw it and he said, it is good. When he created the heavens and the earth, everything was pure. Everything was innocent. Everything was undefiled. And brother head, that's the wine that Jesus created. Innocent, pure, undefiled, 
good wine. 